a Doctor Who fan, standing outside the BBC in London, England, generates a special kind of excitement that is difficult to explain. It's kind of like the fulfillment of a pilgrimage, because here is where one of the most beloved science fiction adventure series for television was born. In the next hour, we'll introduce you to some of the people who have made Doctor Who so special. You'll meet John Pertwee, Peter Davison, Colin Baker, and Tom Baker, and a host of other Doctor Who personalities. But first, we go back to America, where Doctor Who conventions attract fans who enjoy this series so very much. Doctor Who is more than just mindless entertainment. It's like all my friends in school laugh at me because I watch yeah. Doctor Who, but I don't care because I can come here and I can meet all these people that, that, that love the same thing I do. Yeah, I know. It's all worth it. New Jersey Network presents... Baker. Peter Davison. Colin Baker. And special guest John Pertwee. Doctor Who's Who's Who. Whenever and wherever Doctor Who conventions are held, fans converge by the thousands to participate in a group celebration of their favorite television series. All kinds of people are Doctor Who fans, and they share common interests. They're extremely patient, willing to stand in line happily for hours. They're polite, fashionable. They're eager to get their hands on all manner of Doctor Who memorabilia. Business at the vending tables is always brisk, and there are always unexpected surprises. From dreaded Daleks to delightful Doctor Who companions, fans can hobnob with stars like Sarah Sutton, who played the part of Nyssa during the Tom Baker and Peter Davison years, or Ian Martyr, who briefly portrayed medical officer Harry Sullivan, then turned his writing talents to good use, penning paperback versions of the Doctor Who stories. Part of the excitement is dressing up like a favorite character. Leela is a popular costume whenever Louise Jameson is in town. It's equally exciting to hear members of the show's creative team tell spellbinding tales of life behind the scenes. Former script editor Terence Dix has some great stories. Conventions often attract personalities from other science fiction works, like renowned author Dr. Isaac Asimov. It does you a lot of good inside to meet people who are interested in your work and who say so and who tell you they enjoy your work and so on. Sometimes, I suppose, you meet people who don't enjoy your work, but you rely on their being polite. It does annoy me to have people think it's kid stuff. Naturally, it depends on what science fiction you read. Uh, everything can be kid stuff if it's written by people with the minds of kids. And uh, I honestly think that those people who think of science fiction as kid stuff had or to read it themselves, good stuff, and see what it's like. That is always assuming they know how to read, which is by no means a foregone conclusion. George Takei, Mr. Sulu of Star Trek. And I really think science fiction is at the cutting edge of, uh, of any kind of progress that we make as a society and as a civilization. It takes someone who's able to go beyond the norm and say, what if? What? You know, I mean, people, normal people would say, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, that's bizarre, you know. But it takes that kind of per a person who, who, who could say, I wonder if, you know, the what ifs, the people that think the impossible what ifs, they are the ones that make possible the uh, imagineering and the, and the uh, uh, projections on the what ifs of uh, society. Uh, sure, in terms of the mainstream, you know, look at those people in green bodies. Look at those people with sparkly antennas, you know. I mean, I never dress like that in public, going through a public lobby, you know. But these are people that not only, you know, in terms of imagination, go uh, there, but are willing to, body and soul, you know, uh, support that kind of uh, 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 thought. And here it's a gathering of all these people that reinforce each other. What is it that attracts fans to Doctor Who? 
science fiction writer Patrick Daniel O'Neill offers an interesting perspective. I think that part of it is that it is something very unusual for American television. It's science fiction that doesn't take itself too seriously. At the same time that it's trying to tell an interesting and exciting action-adventure story in science fiction, it's willing to look at it and say, let's have some fun with this, let's have a character who has a sense of humor and who can look at an absurd situation and treat it as the absurd situation it is. Uh, in addition, I think just the idea of traveling through time and space and being able to meet anybody or anything uh, conceivable is an attraction to, to a lot of people. Now, specifically, what is Tom Baker's attraction to fans as far as you're, you've been able to fathom? I think among certain women, uh, which is the largest part of his popularity here, as you can tell by the, by, by the percentage of women in the crowd, it is, I think he's a certain extent to a certain extent a father figure. For men, um, I think it's his ability to be unperturbed by anything. Tom Baker's doctor walks into a situation and treats the wildest things as though they were absolutely normal. In addition, I think he brings a certain basic likability. Um, he is easygoing, uh, uh, approachable in a very you know, in a very real sense. He talks about that himself, about how, you know, when he was playing the doctor, little children would come up and, you know, and just automatically, oh, Doctor Who, wow, you know. It really was amazing to be able to pick up children in the street without being moved on as a pervert or a deviant. <laughs> to sit down and, you know, pass over jelly babies or whatever. And sometimes I used to see mothers in the park look hovering anxiously the way mothers hover. And, uh, and the children would get quite embarrassed and say, go away, Mum, it's Doctor Who. <laughs> I think that the real Doctor Who. God, is there anybody here who really doesn't know that? Well, I once wrote a letter to the BBC demanding that I be employed. I said that somewhere there there was a job for me and it was disgraceful. <laughs> and the man was getting, had been to a Doctor Who casting session that afternoon. The part just happened to be free. That's the way it happens sometimes. And he had been to a casting session and had no ideas. And my letter demanding employment was the last letter he read as he was getting into bed. Now, here is a coincidence. I actually knew his wife quite well. But, no, please, please, no. I, I, don't, I don't mean in a biblical sense. Um, I was acquainted with his wife. I mean, we had sometimes held hands in various canteens. Uh, actors are rather extravagant about those sort of things. And he was getting into bed, and he conscientiously read his last letter with a terrifying sigh. She said, oh, bloody Tom Baker demanding employment. And she said, oh, really? I thought he was doing rather grand things. She said, no, no. He says, here, we've got to give him a... He said, you know, I've just come from a casting session this afternoon for Doctor Who. At which Mary Webster, that was his wife's name, said, ring him up now, Bill. <laughs> and at 11 o'clock, I'm lying on my mattress on the floor, being rather self-consciously bohemian, <laughs> and feeling tragically sorry for myself, which sometimes can be a rather unpleasant sensation. <laughs> and the phone went, and it said, Bill Slater here, BBC, come and see me tomorrow. And then my life took another change. That's how it happened. I can scarcely believe it myself. And that's the truth. Just imagine if I wanted to elaborate on this. <laughs> yes, that's all right. That little boy there. Why did I stop being the doctor? Well, I just thought I did a lot of it, you know. <laughs> I thought I really... <laughs> I'd like to go on and do something else, give someone else a chance to do it. Uh, it was just at a time, I, I think I tried to be brave, I tried to be brave, most of the time I'm a frightful coward, but I tried to be brave, I thought, it, I just began to drag my feet about going to work a bit, and began to find myself 
not exactly a, a dagger's drawn, but I began to get more and more critical of scripts or ideas, and then I thought I'd better get out of this, and so I gave someone else a go. Yes, yes. Do I have a personal favourite among us? No, I don't think so, really. I do remember some slightly more than others. I remember admiring the design in our uh, park in space, uh, one or two others, and I remember one about uh, Frankenstein. What was that called? Brain of Morbius, yeah. I like that. There was a scene in that when I knocked on a door and it was pouring with rain and they poured it all around my hat. And when Igor opened the door, I thought it was terribly funny when I wrote the line and I said, excuse me, could you let me have a glass of water? <laughs> Curiously, it didn't go as well as that in the UK, but I'm glad you think it's funny. Yes, that doesn't go out there, yes? Did you ever assume you would have so many American fans, especially women in love with you? Did I? <laughs> Uh, I could never possibly have assumed that, um, that there would be such uh, attention to the program and such kindness to me. I am gratified, and you must understand, of course, I get all the benefit of your attention and often your affection and kindness. When I'm, I was at the front, I mean, there was a backup team, but I, however, I am perfectly willing to not name them and, and take, take all the credit. So selfish I am. No, I didn't dream of it. However, I must say, and this is, I mean, this is a sort of business point, while well, I may mean, know nothing about financial affairs, I am acutely aware, from my point of view, of how valuable and important the audience is to me. I have an existence only in proportion to the number of people in this room who will watch me or respond to me or come and see me or be pleased with me. I have no existence without you. And so, yes, you're important to me. Well, what happened when I, when I first took over the part? I did it because I thought the character was going to be very different. And um, I did make some innovations because I wouldn't have done that myself because I'm not normally that sort of actress. But working with Tom was very stimulating because he re rewrote most of the script. So I kind of started doing the same thing and we sparked off each other a lot. Um, but what happened, because the format of the series was a half hour, if you are writing an adventure story which has to have a cliffhanger at the end of every half hour, you have to have a character who is explaining to the audience the mysteries that are happening, which is why in the end all the Doctor Who assistants end up saying, what's that Doctor? What do you mean? Uh, where are we? So that the explanation has to be done quickly because you haven't got time in half an hour to do it any other way. So by the end of the 26 episodes, my character had regenerated into the sort of little girl lost, which is why I left the show in the end, because I realized, um, as I say, because of the format and the type of writing, it wasn't going to really be able to develop so that's a big drawback with the series i think but now that they're extending it to 50 minutes it might be a better part for whoever does it terence dix script editor during the john pertwee era writer of the five doctors and author of doctor who novelizations who is the doctor's show the doctor carries it whenever he is not on the screen during a cutaway scene or a subplot or whatever it's not as interesting as when he comes back again. And everybody that works on the show must know this, including the companions. Um, if you were to write a show that was overweighted, so that the companions all had marvellous scenes and the Doctor was kicking his heels somewhere, you know, well, you know, you'd very soon hear of it from Tom Baker or John Pertwee or whoever was playing the role in. And not only that, it wouldn't be the right thing to do because um, it, would, it wouldn't be the, you know, it wouldn't be Doctor Who. Doctor Who is about the Doctor. He is the lead, he is the star, he gets all the best lines, he gets all the best scenes. Within that limitation, you do the best you can for the companions. You try not to leave them standing around, you know, like a spare part. You try and give them a good scene, a good moment, a moment of crisis, but it's a subsidiary role, you know, by definition, because that's what it is, and that's what it's supposed to be. And it doesn't matter whether it's a Leela or an Adric, it's still a... It's absolutely, you see, I mean, um, you will, you try and give them the best that you can. You can, I mean, you know, obviously you can have a lot of fun with Leela being bloodthirsty or whatever, you know, and that, that's quite nice. The stronger the role of the companion, in a sense, the easier it is to work for them, work with them. But at the end of the day, they will still be kind of uh, standing around gazing up in admiration at the Doctor. And of course, this is why companions leave more often than doctors do, you see. Doc Doctors leave, say, every five years or six years or three or four years because they get tired and they don't want to get typecast or the whole thing kind of gets them down. Companions tend to leave every year or every two years because they get tired of standing around, you know, with the doctor getting all, all the grammar. 
I got out of it early. A lot of assistants stay longer than that because I got very frustrated. There's only so many ways you can say, what is it, doctor? What is it, doctor? What is it, doctor? You know, you're there as a feed and you can only put so much energy into that. You're there as a device for the doctor to explain to the audience what's going on. How did you approach the role with Leela? Well, um, the first one was written very beautifully by Robert Holmes and so was the story called The Sun Makers and another called Talons of Wang Chiang or Bob Holmes and because he devised the character. Um, my work was cut out for me, it was nice. But as far as the other scripts were concerned, I had to fight long and hard to hold on to a character that didn't scream every time. And You know, I actually got one script that had been written for Liz Sladen uh, and given to me. So I had the Sarah Jane character with the Leela, it was the Leela body. So it was quite, that was quite hard. But I looked at the character and I thought this character is instinct and naivety and a certain amount of generosity and a great deal of aggression. So I combined her with a little four-year-old girl called Sally, who lived upstairs, and my dog. I thought, well, if I can mix these two into one, I'm going to have the character of Leela. And I copied little things like my dog. He used to go like that when he sensed something was wrong, and I tried to bring that into the character, and, you know, those little kind of body language things. How did your dog feel about it? Oh, he loved it. He came in to understudy K-9 in rehearsal sometimes. <laughs> Matthew Waterhouse played the mathematical genius Adric, working with Tom Baker and Peter Davison. His character was very much affected by the personality of the doctor. Um, with Tom, it was very much uh, my character, Adric, was, he was sort of very much saw him as a father figure. And you see, they had a lot in common. I think, even though my character might have been a little irritating and tiresome at times, I would imagine that the doctor as a teenager would have been a pain, <laughs> I'd imagine. And, uh, and I think that the doctor saw a lot of himself as a kid, brilliant mind but immature and reckless uh, in Adric. Uh, that wasn't so much the case with Peter because Peter was younger and Peter himself was more insecure. Peter's doctor was, was less certain of, of himself really. So we actually had more in common, more obviously on screen. Uh, and if you've ever met somebody who has a personality exactly like you, you know the one thing you find is that you won't like them. It's so often the case that when you meet people with the same temperament as you, they irritate you for some reason. So that my relationship with Peter's doctor was that we irritated each other in a lot of ways because we were very alike. What comes to mind when somebody asks you for your, your favorite behind the scenes story? Um, oh, yeah. There's quite a funny one uh, about me. This is kind of against me, really. When I was doing Castrovalva, we when you go on location, when you film, uh, we went away to about 30 miles out of London, stayed in a, a, in a location hotel and shot on this very luxurious um, private estate. And when you get down there, the first thing you do is unpack and you're going to have a drink and drink and drink and drink <laughs> because then the hotel bars don't shut until you really want them to shut. So we drank and I drank so much um, on the night we arrived, really, more than I've ever drunk before, I should think, and more than I've ever drunk since. I don't really want to feel the same way again. But I felt up feeling like death woke up feeling like death warmed up and we had to film this scene right at the end of Castrova where um, we're jogging back to the TARDIS having done something to the master I don't know whether we've blown him up or or left him to be destroyed or whatever we've done to him anyway it wasn't very nice and we're trying about the TARDIS right at the end and I've just been dragged out of this web if you remember I was it strung up in this web and I'm jogging back and I was feeling we were about to film that bit where I, we jogged back to the TARDIS and Peter looked at me he said uh, are you all right? And I said, yes. I said, oh. And uh, so we, they said, action, and we were jogging along, and jogging along, and suddenly I went, and I thought, oh, God, I'm going to throw up. So I ran behind a tree to throw up, but uh, unfortunately the guy on the boom, the sound um, microphone, panned it round to the tree, so that uh, even though me throwing up in immortalized on film it is immortalized in um he was so green on the film despite the fact that he was made up that when it came to the studio we had to make him up green for for, for the whole thing to kind of hang together what he was that? very poorly that day john nathan turner the legendary hawaiian shirt wearing soft-spoken producer of doctor who he became producer in the show's 18th season and has worked with tom baker Peter Davison, and Colin Baker. It was something I'd been campaigning for for a long time, to produce anything. You know, it had been an ambition of mine. 
And I must admit that when I was was asked to take over Doctor Who, and obviously the answer was immediately yes, but there was a fairly daunting aspect to it that a show of that size, of that magnitude, and the sheer number of years it had been running was a, a very daunting prospect, combined with the fact that the, the, the way the show is made is the most complex show that the BBC makes. So as a first off, first time um, producer, it was a fairly substantial challenge, although I didn't stop long enough to, to say no. Tracking back, um, do you remember what your first John Nathan Turner decisions were in terms of direction, or was it more of a subtle thing over time? Did you just sit there and say, ah, now, now I can fix this, it's been bothering me for I, years? I can sort of think uh, about four things I did immediately. One was change the incidental music to the Radiophonic Workshop, which had previously been done by uh, composers, D Dudley Simpson mainly. The other was to change the opening and closing titles. The third was to revamp the signature tune. And the fourth was to get Tom Baker to wear makeup. Tom Baker never wore makeup? He, he didn't wear makeup until I took over as producer, no. Well, I have a great fondness for the master because when I took over the show, the master had been reduced to a kind of decrepit heap at the end of his final regeneration. And I think the character, which I believe was uh, devised by Terence and Barry Letts initially, way back when, and then there was the sad death of Roger Delgado, who played the first master, and I was determined to bring him back. So because I brought him back with this new uh, process of taking over somebody else's body, and then developed him, and I've done a master, at least one master story every year. I have a tremendous fondness for, for the master. Uh, after that, I think I, my main fondness is for the, the companions that I've devised. What was going through your mind when you chose Peter to be the new doctor? Um, obviously, it needed to be something different from Tom, who'd played the character for seven years. Um, Peter has commented to us in an interview that he felt as though, initially anyways, he was suffering from a bit of Tom Baker backlash and that maybe Tom had taken things a little bit too far and that um, the creative people were trying to get things a little bit back under control again. Do you, do you have a response to that and is there anything to it? Um, gosh, what a complex question. Um, Okay. Tom ha had done seven years, I mean, no mean feat, uh, as the Doctor. The longest run of any of the people who played the part up until that point. Therefore, it was essential that we cast against type. Um, I mean, when you compare each of the actors who played the Doctor over the years, they're all extremely different. They all inject an, a huge amount of their own personality, but they're all very, very different to one another. And I wanted to go for a much straighter Doctor, mainly because Tom's gimmick had been the quirkiness. And I felt that if we replaced Tom with somebody who was equally quirky, there would inevitably be a comparison. So I felt that a change defied comparison. Um, backlash from Tom, I wouldn't agree with. Um, from, from what you're saying, Peter said. I think um, prior to my taking over with Tom, Tom had perhaps been encouraged to develop the slapstick side of humor uh, more than was palatable. That is a personal opinion. And what I tried to do when I took over with Tom was to eliminate the slapstick or play down the slapstick and ignite the wit so that it, it was a witty doctor as opposed to somebody who bumped into doors and tripped over scarves. So that I think that where Peter came in, the change had already been made from a slapstick doctor into a witty doctor, and I think that Peter carried on that wit. Peter was deliberately a, a much straighter um, aspect of the doctor. I mean, that's certainly, certainly true, but that was deliberate. 
and consequently after Peter decided to leave we can follow him with somebody who is now very very different to the straight heroic youthful doctor with with uh, Colin still to come Peter Davison Colin Baker and our exclusive conversation with John Pertwee when Doctor Who's Who's Who continues You felt you were suffering from a bit of Tom Baker backlash. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, it was really uh, um, with regard to the amount and the sort of humor that was in the program when Tom did it. Uh, I always felt, I watched uh, Tom Baker's last year intently because that hadn't gone out when I, when I was given the part and I, I knew I was going to play it. Uh, and I watched it sporadically during Tom's uh, time as the Doctor. And I do remember thinking that uh, I think they went too far in one, in, in one way, packing it with rather kind of almost what they call in Britain undergraduate humor, almost. So I, I did think that there was just too much of it. And, but what I felt was when I took over, there, there was too much of a pulling back from it. I think that uh, uh, it was felt that to make up for the fact that there had been too much uh, towards the end of Tom's time, they would have none at the beginning of mine time. Uh, so I spent a lot of the, the first uh, few uh, stories trying to inject a little of my kind of uh, humor into it. And John, would, John and I would kind of battle it out to see if I got it past the producer's run, uh, which is, it, was, it was quite fun. But I do think that it was maybe a little sort of uh, pulling back from the humor. Were you a fan of Doctor Who for years before you ever auditioned for that part? Yeah. I uh, watched Doctor Who from the second episode onwards. I missed the first episode. Uh, they actually showed the first episode twice, and I missed it twice, but I watched it uh, really avidly for the first six years it was on, during William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton's time. With that history, mm -hmm. how did you set about playing the Doctor when, when you found out that you were going to be Doctor number five? Well, I, uh, I really took, tried to bring... First of all, I had no idea what I was going to do, because it seemed to me uh, uh, that I couldn't do it. Uh, every actor, when it's offered a big part of it, I'm sure, always thinks they can't do it. So I tried to draw on really the first two Doctors, mainly. A uh, bit of John Pertwee, but really not Tom Baker, because I think he'd been so recent, and I really, I guess, did feel uh, that he, he would sort of take care of himself. But I wanted to bring bits of uh, William Hartnell and Patrick Trout into it, so they're the people that I based it mainly on. I love the kind of vulnerable quality that Patrick Troughton had especially, which I wanted to try and get into it. But apart from that, you, you start off with kind of a, a few basics and then hope that the thing grows. To a certain extent, you start off, uh, if you like, blandly, because you have to commit yourself from uh, uh, day one. So you can't be too definite about what you're going to do, I don't think. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with it, or you're going to have to make a very big about turn if you decide that this is not the right direction. So uh, I, I always start off in a fairly kind of uh, bland way with a few basics that I'm, I'm sure about, and then let it grow from that. Uh, I personally, having worked on the program for three years, don't think that realistically there is a bigger role for assistants. I mean, I think that the, the job of the assistant, if you like, is to say, what is it, doctor? Help doctor, and for the doctor to get them out of trouble. Uh, it was tried several times uh, in my time as Doctor Who to have uh, more interesting assistants. It was one thing that, thing that John wanted to bring in more. Uh, we had uh, Tegan, who was very aggressive, um, you know, very blunt, didn't get on particularly well with the Doctor. We had Turlo, who was plain bad, he wanted to kill the Doctor. Uh, Despite that, I think the assistant that worked uh, best was Nyssa, from my point of view, who uh, was just simply the simplest assistant. She was a nice person, and uh, she was bright. There's nothing wrong with that. They don't have to be stupid. But uh, I do think that their, real, their job in Doctor Who is to get into trouble, if you like, and for the Doctor to get them out. When you were going through the regeneration scene, in Caves of Androzani. What was going through your mind as, as you were playing that very last scene that was to transform in, <clears throat> into Colin Baker? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there were, I remember thinking at uh, one point during the day of the, you know, the, that, that recording, oh, heavens, what have I done? <laughs> but at the same time, is, I, I did remember very distinctly 
the, the time when I had uh, done my regeneration uh, from Tom Baker into myself. And uh, it was a panic then, and it ended up being just as big a panic when, uh, when Colin and I did it. It was, it was sort of something that I thought about and, you know, thought, oh, this is it. This is the last moment. But then before you know it, you've done it, and that's it. And I remember standing just off camera and seeing Colin sit up and do that, uh, uh, you know, the... So his, li his first line as Doctor Who, and th feeling just a couple of pangs. I found the actual scene of regeneration the most difficult thing I've had to do since I've taken the part on. Because, um, in practice, what happened was that Peter Davison was making the story, A Case of Androzani, on one of the studio days, I had to come in uh, to do, essentially, three lines. Uh, which meant that I came in in the morning, so I was there. They were behind schedule, which meant that they were having unfortunately, to cut various scenes as they went along because they weren't going to finish in time otherwise. So there was an atmosphere of busyness there. Uh, all I had to focus on was that one very short scene. And any actor would tell you the most difficult things to do are small parts because you focus all your attention and uh, concentration on that small part. If you're playing the, the lead part, you can't think about the whole of it all the time. So you just have to steam in and get on with it. Playing a little scene like that means it gets a disproportionate amount of your um, involvement. So I was waiting around for hours in order to nip quickly into the TARDIS and lie on the floor and sit up and say those three lines with Nicola. Uh, it's not that I actually got particularly nervous about it, but uh, instead of doing it in a relaxed way, I, I was over and down it with importance, which meant that I personally am not over pleased with that very brief scene. It's, it's fine, it's acceptable, but I'd like to do it again now and just slip it into the middle of something else I was doing so that it was uh, more to my satisfaction. What did you go through as an actor in preparing yourself to take on the role? Did you decide that you were going to play it a certain way and you knew that John would approve of that way or did you actually sit down in a process of deliberation, how am I going to deal with X, Y or Z? Yes, well we, during that period between him first suggesting that he thought I might be suitable to play the part and him subsequently offering it to me. There were a period of about four or five weeks where I went away with some old tapes of uh, all the, my predecessors, not with any intention of copying what they were doing, but just so that I could almost subliminally assimilate whatever quality that it is that is common to all of the doctors. And there are um, various essentials which are the doctor. Uh, not that I could write them down in a list, but you sort of get to feel it after a while. And then uh, I came to meet with John and the script editor and the, the head of um, the series department of the BBC and we discussed the way, in general terms, I thought I would like to play the part. And they said what they saw in me that made them think of me as being suitable. And it turned out that we were, I mean, within very narrow margins in total agreement. So uh, then the writers were briefed to write the stories and we just took off from there. I mean, I, there were characteristics which I wanted to enhance. Um, they have always been there. I mean, I, I wanted my doctor to be, for instance, arrogant. Not in a deeply unpleasant way, but uh, uh, to be quite strong on arrogance, wit. I wanted to uh, be fairly active, um, in the same way that Pertwee was a very active physical doctor. I wanted that. I wanted the, the occasional tetchiness of Hartnell. Um, some of the off-the-wall kind of uh, offbeat stuff that Troughton produced, the honesty of Peter Davison, um, and li little bits drawn from all the doctors, plus, I hope, a large amount of something original from myself. Obviously, there are bound to be favourites uh, that people have. I, I think people tend to have as the favourite the one they first watched, um, especially if they watched Doctor Who, when, in, in the case of England, when they were young children then they will always say, oh yes, the best Doctor was, and it turns out to be the one that they w was playing the part when they first started watching it. I, I think that gets less and less the case now it is so firmly established that it's a character which regenerates. For the first couple of times, I mean, especially in the case of Hartnell to Troughton, it must have been a great shock, because it was a very novel idea uh, to have a character which is capable of changing its total appearance. Now it's established. It's happened five times. I'm the sixth Doctor. It's, it's no longer such a great shock. In fact, it's a feature of the program. Uh, it's quite an exciting moment. There's a, it's sadness tinged with excitement. We're losing something very familiar, but something exciting is going to happen. 
Um, so I, I think I'm benefiting from that at the same time as suffering from the disappointment maybe of some fans. I've had letters ranging through the whole spectrum, some saying, uh, I think you're great, I think you're wonderful, I'm so glad you're playing the Doctor, to others saying, I have stopped watching Doctor Who, but now Peter's gone. Um, between the two lies uh, a constant, I guess. Another petition. Doctor Who fans do tend to write a lot of letters. Many of them wind up at the BBC office of John Nathan Turner and his assistant, Sarah Lee. Oh. Hello, Doctor Who. Yeah. In addition okay. to the usual fan mail, thousands of calls right. and letters poured in from okay, all then. over the world all when right, BBC then. controller Michael Grade announced plans to suspend production of the series for 18 months. Public reaction was immediate, bordering on overwhelming. Illinois. Put them all over the place. This one from Australia. Just down the road at BBC Enterprises, the sales division of BBC, Roger Brunskill, editor of Program Adaptations, receives fan complaints. And I had letters, and I've got letters in this file here, which um, threatened me almost with my uh, with, uh, fear of my life, saying we've got people in high places who are going to come around and sort you out and things like that, and even witch-like spells made my sort of water turn to acid and things like that, all in here. More often than not, Roger is in fact a hero in the eyes of Doctor Who fans. His relentless work led to the recovery of nine John Pertwee episodes that were believed to have been lost forever. We began to search the film library where our tapes and films are stored in bulk. Well now, BBC Enterprises actually made film copies of these early Doctor Whos for those countries that weren't able to show programs on videotape. The videotape machine is very expensive, but the film machine is cheaper, and of course, by showing things on film, you don't have to worry about changing it to the country's technical standard. Anyway, of these nine stories, five we found were, did exist in black and white um, negatives and in very good quality. And the situation in the United States is that Doctor Who has taken off so much that even black and white is acceptable. So we were able to recover five stories completely in black and white, the episodes, and make movies of them, um, and dispatch them to our trading partners in the States, Lionheart. And the other four, some of them were incomplete. Some of the episodes were missing. So we re-edited all the other episodes to make sense, as if there never was a missing episode. Also, we found in Australia, in our, some of our trading partners' vaults, ABC in Australia, we found some old videotape colour copies of, of, of John Pertwee. So we have recovered completely all the nine Doctor Who John Pertwee stories, the third Doctor. When we return, our exclusive interview with John Pertwee, an eerie excursion into the BBC Enterprises storage vaults, and fan comments from the streets of London. Stay tuned. these for a while, you develop a very healthy respect for the actors who have to hide underneath these masks. Wearing a mask is harder than you might think. So is exploring the prop vault of BBC Enterprises. While there's something sad about creatures that live on a screen lying lifeless in a basement, you're never quite sure. Maybe they're just sleeping. These things are malevolent. It's a tribute to the people who build them that even when not being used, even when covered with several layers of dust, they're still monstrous. You want to go over and touch them, but it's probably best to let sleeping Daleks lie. You want to put your hand near one of the mouths to check for breath, assuming you can muster the courage to get close enough to one. Yes, exploring a prop vault is harder than you might think. But then you spot something friendly, the TARDIS. And as the gates slide open, you're off through time and space. Before you know it, you're sitting in the living room of Dr. Number 3, John Pertwee. Thinking back to when you first took over the part, what was going through your mind? Well, I remember Sean Sutton, who was the head of programs, and he was an old mate of mine. He and I had been in the West End with the two... I was the youngest leading man on the West End, and he was the youngest stage manager, so we were pretty close friends. And he was the one who asked me to do it. And uh, But when I asked him how he wanted it played, he said, there's John Pertry. And I said, well, who the hell's that? Because I had no idea who I was, because I'd never been me. I was rather like my 
great friend, the late Peter Sellers, who always hid under a green umbrella himself. He'd never played himself in anything. He never wanted to, nor did I. And so when he asked me to do that, I didn't really know how to approach it at all, because I'd never ever been myself in anything. How long did it take you to kind of sort that out and put it in? Rather it? a long time, really, to, to be used to it, you know, to get to, to be comfortable with it. I wasn't comfortable with the, with the idea at all. People were very good to me. My producers were very good to me. They, they gave me very free reign, which I didn't anticipate. I didn't expect that I'd get such free reign. I thought I was going to be held back. Uh, thank the Lord, the original producer who'd suggested me to take the, the role, uh, left. Uh, almost immediately I arrived, and his intention was that I should be what I was like in the lighter side of my profession, which is when I was working in vaudeville, or what, is that what you call it? Vaudeville. We call it music hall and, and variety. And I was working as a stand-up comic, and I used to play the guitar, and I satirized folk music, and I tumbled and fell about. And he evidently wanted me to play Doctor Who like that, presumably because Pat had been a bit of a musical clown, and he thought this would be a nice little go on from that. Uh, but I didn't want to do anything like that at all. Uh, once I'd given up music hall, I wanted to go back to being an actor. So I was very pleased, in fact, when Barry Letts took over and I was able to play it the way that I wanted to under Barry's wing. Uh, he was, uh, I say, very uh, understanding because he let me have free reign to my love of gadgetry and clothing, of course, although the, the, the dress idea was mine. And uh, and as soon as I saw a gadget of any sort at all, something new in a motor show or the boat show, I'd ring up Barry and say, I found a marvelous motorcycle that folds up into a briefcase. And he'd say, oh, terrific, you know, we'll have it in Doctor Who, and we did. Do you remember very much about the early episodes that you shot, Spearhead and uh, the Silurians? And things yeah, like quite a bit, yes. So, uh, I've got fairly good recall. Um, but of course, when you, you work in a show like that, for making as many programs as I made over that, whatever it was, four or five years, uh, they all get rather jumbled up into one, one big memory. So you get a more of an overall impression than an individual impression. What is your overall impression of, of Doctor Who during... Oh, enormous era? fun. Uh, uh, because my uh, way of working was uh, rather different from most people's. I, I think that you get the best out of actors, you want to make them laugh, and everybody being very happy and jovial. But of course, the, uh, the management side of the business are inclined to disagree with that. They think you're wasting time, and they think you're wasting film, and so on. And, uh, and so I, I got hauled over the coals a bit to begin with, because I didn't, uh, to them, take things seriously enough. But um, eventually, they got to realize that, in fact, all the work was done, and it was coming out quite well. Once you had become comfortable with the, the character you were going to play, what was your acting mindset as far as doing Doctor Who was concerned? And how did it differ from, from other acting jobs that you had had? The pay was better. Um, uh, it was nice to be working in fantasy for a change. Uh, I don't know. I'm a jobbing actor. People often ask me, you know, what did I feel? What did I think? When I was the doctor and I met the maggots, what did I think? I didn't think anything except um, when, you know, how much longer we got before lunch. We're actors. We just do the job that's written down for you to do and say. I think a lot of people look too deeply into it and um, want to get into your head. Uh, Doctor Who was never right in my head. Uh, I was in my head, but not Doctor Who wasn't. Uh, and and uh, I endeavored to make it clear which was which. Are you a fan of science fiction in general? No. No, I have nothing to do with it at all. I've never read any of it before, and I've never read any of it since. It was an acting job, which I enjoyed very much. Are you surprised at the, at the the fan response to uh, the doctor still? I mean, your doctor has obviously stood the test of time. I'm staggered, but I'm but we're all staggered by American fandom. It, it's quite different, you know. There's there's no comparison at all between fandom in England and fandom in the United States. Uh, for a start, the a, their their age is considerably higher in America. The average fan age in America, I think, is between. Um, 24 and 32 or something. Uh, in England, it's much, much younger. Or those that admit to it. You know, the English people don't admit to uh, to being fans. Uh, my present series, Wurzel Gummidge, uh, has, in fact, more adults than children watching it, as we had in Doctor Who. Uh, but they, they don't really admit to it. But when we do it on the stage, 
uh, very often you'll see one very small child on the knee of five people sitting in the front row of the stalls. And I'd go up and say, hello, what are you doing here? And they'd say, well, we thought we'd just, you know, uh, bring the grandchild to see you, you know, if they, he likes your program. And I said, well, it takes five of you to bring him. <laughs> and it's very much the same with, uh, with Doctor Who in, in this country. But in, in America, they're, they're entirely different. Far more open, far more erudite. Uh, they, they've got far more to say about things. I mean, the conventions are staggering. The questions you get asked are unanswerable, a lot of them. I can't answer them. I'd now admit to it. I used to try and cover up. No, I don't bother. I said, there's a fellow down here in the front. You'll know much better the answer to that than I do. They've, they've, they've got used to the fact that now we do it. We say, look, we are actors. We, are, we just play the roles. I'm not get it clear, Doctor Who. Because to begin with, you know, they really believe that you are. Talk Daleks a little bit. Well, I mean, for a start, they look as if they made a lot of tennis balls, stuff on a bit of free fire. Um, I, I never liked the way they looked. The Terry Nations had some private ones, which were in very good nick. They looked good. You also saw the twinkling feet of the operators from time to time, under the skirts, the little feet going along, working them. And, of course, they were, this, they were supposed to be the, the, the most evil beings on Earth, or at least they weren't beings. Of course, they were only encasements for a being inside. But the, they were the, 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 rest, the, the most intelligent beings. Uh, and uh, it didn't strike me they were that intelligent because you only had to run down a flight of three steps, you had them screwed. Because <laughs> they couldn't go downstairs. So, <laughs> so they didn't seem to be that bright. What was your favorite monsters. villain or monster? Uh, well, I, I, I liked... Um, yeah, do also, to go back on the Daleks, you know how often people thought up frightfully clever things about how to defeat the dialect by standing at its back so it couldn't see you. Yeah, that's pretty banal, isn't it, really? And then as it turned round, they turned round with it. And it didn't have an eye at the back. No, they weren't very bright. Design flaw. Yeah, and there was also that sink pump in the front. I didn't care for that. No, my favourites were the, uh, with the advent of a half mask. I think that's when monsters really came into their own once we started using half masks. Once you can use the, the expression of the human eye, and the mouth and the lips, then you, th then you can do anything. And the Ogrons were the first we had, which were very tall ex-boxers, most of them, and stuntmen. And uh, they, they had, you remember, their very sort of high forehead and long hair, and sort of very spatulate and noses, and uh, frightening-looking faces. And they were just half, and they just went over the top of the lip. And then they had a moustache line, which went here, which covered the, this line and the human jaw underneath. And of course, this was a remarkable effect because you, you, you saw the expression of the eye and, and the jaw could move. And this was the first time that anything looked right, I think, in the way of a, of a monster that had to speak. Uh, then we had the, the draconians, which were even better. They were even better made. And I think those were, those were my favorite monsters, really, where the draconians were. It's much easier to play to a monster that has something that you can play off. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, trying playing with an ice warrior, it's just ridiculous, because it went, I want you to get some kind of rubber thing. <laughs> it wasn't good. Why was it that you began to feel as though it was time to move on after five years? Ah, uh, well, first of all, Roger Delgado was killed, and Roger was one of my greatest friends, both off and on, and that, that shook me out very much. Um, then Barry left. And Barry Letts, to me, was, was the man that really held Doctor Who together, because not only was he a wonderful director, but a very fine producer, but he was also an, he was an, an ex-actor. So nobody knew the, the problems better than Barry did. So Barry could see it from the actor's point of view, from the producer's point of view, and, in fact, as we now all know, the writer's point of view, because he wrote some of the best Doctor Who stories ever. And uh, Terence Dix, the script editor, left, and he was another friend. And, uh, and it looked as if the team was rather breaking up. And I thought, well, that's an era. I'll go now. And so I, I, I took a job in a series which was called Who Done It, which was a crime quiz series. And of course, all the fans thought that it was Doctor Who Done It. <laughs> and so they, all, they carried on watching that. The details of John's childhood and early career are documented in his autobiography, Moon Boots and Dinner Suits. A particularly fun time or a particularly difficult time? No, I thought when I started the book that, it, that I was going to have a terrible problem in remembering everything. In fact, I started the book by the, with a tape recorder. I sat in a, in a room and uh, 
switched the tape recorder on and held the microphone in front of my face and the start and went bright scarlet and almost threw up with nerves and, and threw the tape recorder the length of the room and said, this is ridiculous, I cannot talk into this horrible machine. And so I started doing it with a, on a pad on my knee with, with a pencil sitting in the sun and uh, out in the mountains. We have a place in, out in Andorra where I go skiing. Then I sat in the sun every morning for about two or three months and, uh, and it all started to flow. But I didn't think that I'd remember all the things that I did about my childhood. I, I, as I was telling you earlier, I mean, I rang my brothers up to ask them if they could just help me with certain stories. They didn't even remember the situation. They didn't remember the stories at all. Even when I'd written them and I showed them to them, they said, I don't think that ever happened. I said, we well, don't think I made it up. And they said, probably. <laughs> but I know I didn't because I remembered it vividly. Um, so it, it, it began to flow very easily. Um, one thing, you know, started off the machine going and, uh, and one thing helped another recall, another memory. Do you enjoy reading it? Enjoy reading it? Yeah. Uh, yes. I did because I became impersonal about it. I, 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 a lot of it I read and I laughed at because I forgot it was me. Why did you stop at, at the period where you did? A lot of it is, is family history and sort of the, uh, the evolution of um, the John Pertwee who kept getting kicked out of schools and things <laughs> like that. Well, that's, that's really it. I, I was asked to do an autobiography, which they, they uh, assured, assured me later, or tried to assure me, but I wasn't having any of it, that autobiographies are the story of your life. And I said, no, they're not. They could be an autobiography and be a part of your life. Many people have written autobiographies in several books. And uh, by the time I'd finished, or I got up to 1945, I thought, well, this is a book. I mean, I've got another 40 years to go. I, this is going to be the tone. It's going to be like carrying the Holy Bible around with them. It's going to be that fat. Or Encyclopedia Britannica. So I said, I said well, I'll stop there and then do, and do another follow-up later. What's your favorite part of the book? My favorite parts of the book are what you thought were the best written. Who's your favorite doctor? The one with the grey hair. Pertwee? Yeah. What do you like about him? He was just good, like, because when I was little, he was the one that was mostly around. So he's the best, like, and he used to go, he's more in the country, he never, like, went into space, mostly. John Pertwee is my favorite doctor, and I think it's, it's British tradition, Doctor Who, and I don't think they should take it off. It's just, like, abandoning the royal family, is what I think. My favorite doctor, I would have to say, is John Pertwee, because I think he holds the most character. Who's your favorite? Doctor Who? Yeah. Well, the one I was brought up with, um, Bill Petwee. Well, no, not Bill Petwee, John Petwee. I, I watched all the Doctor Who's. I like the one with the white hair the best. I like the um, red light. Um, no, the blue light. Uh, Dalek. <laughs> How long have you been watching Doctor Who? Um, so ever since I can see, um, about eight years now. Or almost as long as I've been alive. I mean, where would children be without Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't have any childhood, would they? <laughs>